Hi, everybody. I have a new mic. That's the first thing I want to call your attention to today. Um, I'm sorry it took this long, but it's been a roller coaster as far as finding something that was compatible and that worked. There have been a few people that have not been able to hear me, and there are several people that had no problem, so I don't really understand that, but I'm hoping that this works for everybody. And if you were one of those people, could you please comment and let me know that you can hear me now? I'm, you know, hopeful, but I, I think everything works. Everything that we've tested has been really good. In any case, today I would like to talk about how I found out I have cancer and when I was first diagnosed and the signs and symptoms that, in case you're concerned, what you should not ignore. Okay? So I was about 36 and I started getting a pain in my, uh, in my lower abdomen on the right side. And I went to a gynecologist and they couldn't feel anything with a physical exam. So they said, it's probably just gas. Okay. I think like, Mm, six months later, I was still having these pains and it was kind of intermittent. I could go a month with no pain and then I'd go through a week with a horrible pain. And so at some point I decided I better get a second opinion because this is just not normal. There's no way I had gas for six months. And I, and it just, it, it wasn't gas. I mean, I knew it wasn't gas. It was crazy to have gas where I felt it, which would be where my ovary was. and. So another gynecologist did the same thing, dismissed me. Now, at this time, there was no Obamacare, um, no Affordable Care Health Care Act. So there was no marketplace for me to get insurance. And at the time, I made too much money for uh, Medicaid, and I didn't make enough money for premiums. So... Go figure. And not anybody really didn't want to insure me anyway because of my diabetes. So I um, had realized later in hindsight, I think I was dismissed because I didn't have insurance. And they knew the next step would have been some imaging. You know, so, so that kind of sucked. I mean, no, that really sucked. And I don't know if it would have made a difference in my prognosis or not. When I got married, I had insurance. And it wasn't great insurance, but at least it was insurance. And it was, it was okay, you know. So I finally went to, a, a, after the, no, the third dismissal, then I got the insurance about a year later because I was really, you know, that's not why I got married. And in fact, that's similar to my story with my present husband, and that's also not why I got married. But I feel like spirit just makes things happen for us. So after like the third doctor, I remember being in a museum in Alexandria, Virginia. And I almost fell over. I had to crouch down. I literally doubled over with pain. And it was the worst pain I've ever had by far. I mean, there's no other pain I've ever had that it was that bad. And so I got a physical from a new GP and you know, she did everything. And I said to her, by the way, I'm having this pain. And if you tell me it's just gas, then I'm not coming back. You will not see me again. And now I had insurance, right? So the first thing she said was, oh, okay, let's get you an ultrasound. Okay, thank you. And I think that this is a horrible thing that we do in, in the United States or anywhere, really. But um, yeah, this is the way it went down. And she was a very nice doctor. Um, so I got an ultrasound and lo and behold, there was something on it. There was a mass right where my pain was. It turned out there were two masses. The other one was really small, but this was a, a fairly large tumor. I um, 
was referred out to a gynecologist. And it wasn't an oncologist necessarily. I don't think it was an oncology gynecologist. They thought it was a dermoid cyst. I knew it was not a cyst because dermoids are known to grow very fast. And I'd had this for a couple years at this point. There was no way. And I figured it would be a football by that time. So I didn't say anything. I just like, let's go, with, let's roll with it, let's roll with it. So a dermoid cyst is not cancerous, you know. So I was told this was probably a dermoid, so we should probably get it out soon. Okay, good. I don't want to be in pain anymore. So I woke up, fast forward, I woke up from surgery and my then husband was with me and I said, how did it go? And he said, they didn't do anything. He said, they opened you up and everything looked like a funnel cake. And she apparently took some pictures and uh, gave them to him when she took apparently a lot of pictures. And it did look a little strange. I had one ovary like stuck to the back of my pelvis and the other one was really forward. But they still didn't think it was cancer. But I had omentum, which is the lining of your uh, stomach, well, not your stomach, but your whole abdominal area is covered in um, like a, almost like a fatty tissue to protect your organs. And it was just either overgrown or, you know, there, there was just, they just had to remove a lot of it in any case. So she comes back at us. We couldn't, she could not perform any surgery because it was just a mess in there. And I had also gone to her because we wanted to have a child. I mean, I was 38 at the time. And she had said, well, if you're going to have one, you better do it. But this kind of, you know, God took care of that. So I guess I just was not meant to have biological children. So I, um, I waited a while actually before I could get the surgery because she needed to put together what she called the dream team. And I had three surgeons. She was going to save as much as she could, but no, they, they couldn't even do it laparoscopically. Um, and they took everything out. I mean, I, I even my appendix, um, it was just covered in this stuff. It was stuck to it. It's supposed to be stuck to your, your your abdomen wall and instead it was like glued to the organs so it really and and they call that debulking surgery debulking is you know and it's not a really common word except when you have ovarian cancer whether it's low grade or high grade so then i get a call a few days after I'm home and I had a follow-up appointment on Monday but it was Friday they wanted to see if I could come in on Friday and I you know I, I wasn't able to so I just said no Monday's fine it's not a problem I just figured they were trying to um, change an appointment because they had the room but it was fine still not talking about cancer so I get there and my husband's sitting in one chair and I'm sitting in the other in the doctor's office and she starts reading something and she goes and then she mentions cancer and she keeps going and she's rattling things off. I'm like, yeah, wait. I mean, he and I just looked at each other and I'm sorry, so could you back up? Did you say cancer? Did you just say I have cancer? And she goes, yes, but it doesn't have to be taken care of right away because it's low-grade serous and, you know, that buys you a lot of time. I'm like, wow. Well, she had everything that comes out of you has to be biopsied, of course. But she had a suspicion that this was not a dermoid cyst when she took it out. And I didn't know this, but she had a friend up in 
MIT, and that's where the slides went. And of course, they keep some slides so that I can get second opinions and everything. But um, oops. sorry, let's make sure this mic's still working. Um, I didn't mean to make noise. So this um, this was a you know obviously a big blow, and then we learned it was a very rare form of ovarian cancer. Um, they didn't call it ovarian cancer at that point. They called it primary peritoneal carcinoma. And that is the same tissue of the ovary, but it's sort of outside the ovary. And in that, that lining, it's of the same tissue, but it resides outside the ovary, basically. Those tumors were on the outside. So... I don't know at the time until they had the surgery that there was a second one. They were only interested in that one that I named Pedro. I cannot tell you why I named him Pedro, but I figured we'd been attached to the hip. Okay, yeah, I know. Dad jokes are just flying out of me lately. <laughs> so from there, we decided it would be good to get second and third opinion. And she sent me to someone, and I was the first case for everyone. Yeah, at the time, there was only maybe 500 people a year diagnosed with this particular ovarian cancer. And when they looked at the photographs and imaging and saw where my ovaries were at the time and my fallopian tubes, and it just kind of looked like all mangled up. He said, did you fall uh, like off your bike in front of your handlebars as a child or something? And I was like, I thought that was the weirdest question. Uh, like, no. And I don't, I really can't say why, but I guess, <clears throat> I guess it was part of the cancer that made everything a little bit wonky. So nothing was normal inside. And I just got that, you know, we probably need some chemotherapy. I don't remember getting a whole lot out of this person, but I thought, you know, you just don't have that experience that I want, that I'm going to feel confident about. So then I went to John Hopkins. And, you know, they were really pretty good with the diagnosis as far as it was a low-grade serous. Um, and they probably knew more than anybody, but I still was not comfortable with the doctor I saw there. And then we went to Georgetown University Hospital and had a wonderful doctor. He said, we should probably just do chemotherapy right away. Okay, obviously didn't need surgery because I had that already. Usually, when you have a diagnosis from a biopsy, you have your chemotherapy first and then your surgery. But since they didn't suspect it was cancer, I had the surgery first and the other way around. So, um, so I had the six treatments that was kind of golden seal. It was Taxol and uh, Carboplatin. And then I had to switch to Taxotere and Carboplatin because I was really having a lot of pain in my muscles because of the Taxol, um, especially my calves. It just felt like the meat was coming off the bones. Um, so they switched me and I did a little bit better. And I did some alternative therapies during this. Um, I had some Qigong done and some Reiki and things like that. And whether that helped or not, I don't know, but I think it did keep me... Um, more balanced. I did have a lot of symptoms from the chemo. And uh, so that was my first experience being bald, of course. And so about six months later, I had a PET scan, everything looked clear. Um, so I was NED, which is a kind of a newer term, no evidence of disease. And really thought I was in the clear. I mean, I always was concerned about a recurrence, but I wasn't too worried about it because they never really talked about it. And I think it's, I know I wasn't the doc, Dr. Barnes. He was the one, he's since retired. 
um, from Georgetown University. Um, he never really said that, you know, this could come back. And, and I don't think it was his first, I was his first case. I was probably, he was probably the first doctor that I wasn't their first case. And uh, so I lived my life dumb, fat, and happy for the next 20 years. I did not have the same symptoms when I was diagnosed again. All through the years, I was getting, well, the, for the first five years, I was getting some imaging done every three, maybe the first year was every three months, and then it was every six months, and then it was yearly after five years. And I was pretty good about that. I didn't get the same pains or anything this time around. It was just different. So about maybe 18 months ago now, I was having a lot of, I was having some bloating. I was, I was feeling lethargic. I, let's see what else I was going through. Change in bowel. Yeah, I was having a lot of diarrhea. And so I had gone to my GP. I, I was, and I still do, get regular checkups for my diabetes maintenance. And while I was there, I explained the symptoms I was having. And she said that you're pretty much due for your, your next CT scan. So let's do that. And so the CT scan revealed a lot of scar tissue from my sur past surgeries and a little bit more than that. There were some things that were undetermined, but they recommended that I do some further studies or imaging. So they sent me for a, a PET scan and it became more obvious to them that I was no longer NED. And I think if they didn't already know the history that I had, they may not have looked at that. They may have just said that was just scar tissue. So some of it was scar tissue, a lot of it was scar tissue. And then some of areas were definitely suspicious. So right then, I mean, I knew. I knew, and I think they knew. They started opening up and saying the word remission is you know, recurrence and um and cancer cancer recurrence and yeah that was a little disheartening i mean i felt like from there everything was just going through the motions and now at that point i have another husband and a whole new set of firsts now, I find so many new things out. I am not the first patient for all these people. And in fact, there's more like 2,000 people a year diagnosed with this particular cancer. And now they call it ovarian cancer, but um, low-grade serous. That's the rare part. High grade is your more common cancers. And that's about, though there are some differences that are obvious, and that is the rate of the growth. Smaller tumors sometimes, but little and lethal. And instead of having a Pedro attached to me, I have the, the, that particular pet skin showed that there were a lot of small uh, tumors. Now, maybe if they were bunched up together, that would add up to one big tumor. But that's even harder to detect on imaging. That's why it was just sus suspect, you know. And the PET scan, you know, was pretty, you know, everybody said, yeah, this is, this is cancer. So I went in for a biopsy where... Uh, in the area that was most, you know, concentrated with 
the tumors. And then they were able to confirm that it was a recurrence. Now, at this point, I'm already feeling like, okay, this is going to be more aggressive. Second time around, this isn't good. This is really, really not good. And I had this feeling. So I saw an oncologist, which long story short, I ended up changing oncologists after the PET scan. I just wasn't really happy with the, um, the place I was going to get chemotherapy. And so I went to Ann Barshinger, Ann B. Barshinger Cancer Institute in, uh, in Lancaster, PA. And, and I'm still, I'm very happy with these people. They're, they're wonderful. Um, but I was told by both of these oncologists that typically chemotherapy doesn't work on this particular cancer. And I think that's probably why the prognosis isn't good for the most part. But they said because I had it before and it might have been effective. And I say might have because I had the uh the surgery first and i figured maybe there wasn't anything left in there that was cancer and maybe there was no need for that chemotherapy last time it was just going to grow it may not have worked obviously if it was recurring then it only takes one cancer cell in there to start dividing again you know what i'm saying and anyway I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting off track. They said, but since, since, you know, it has apparently worked for you before, let's try that. I took three treatments and there was no changes. And I was actually having a reaction to the carboplatin. So they wanted to do it on different days. And I, the, I said to the doctor, is this, this is not working. So I opted to stop the treatments and the oncologist agreed that we were probably just going through the motions for those other three. So why, you know, add to the physical aspects to my body um, and take that chance? And then my option was surgery again. This time I woke up from surgery and I didn't get good news there either. It was not operable. I had two surgeons go in, and she said that there was just so much scar tissue that it probably did look a little like the momentum. It was sort of like stuck to everything, and, and they couldn't get through the scar tissue they cleaned up what they could, where they could see it. And they could see it, believe me, they could see it through the scar tissue, but the pelvis, they couldn't even get down there. They couldn't even get down there. So debulking this time wasn't really possible. So they cleaned up what they could. And, um, you know, I don't know whether that really bought me any time or not, but that was it. The only options at that point were oral chemo agents to maybe prolong my life for a little bit. They tend to last about maybe two to three years. The side effects are horrible. And I did try one and the, heart, the side effects were horrible. My blood sugar was so high. And I just decided this was not acceptable to me. I mean, other things, it was just awful. Um, but that wasn't acceptable because then my doctor, my, my GP, wanted to put me on insulin. And I'm like, no, I worked really hard to get things under control. And if I have complications of that, you know, I could die from the diabetes before the cancer. So... The, and, and if you're wondering about more, I'm not, I'm not going to go any further than this, but if you're wondering about more, I have a video called My Cancer, My Choice. And then you can, you know, 
I'll reference it. So there we are. And here I am. And I'm still here. But um, I think by not taking any more drugs, which there's only about two other options, I think I'm living a little better. I belong to a Facebook group and I follow it pretty closely. I don't post a lot, but I see a lot of people taking these particular drugs and really having a hard time. And some people that it just stopped working or it didn't work after a few months. So I feel like I feel better. I don't feel great. I get nausea and I get a lot of things. So I have terminal cancer. And I've come to accept that. I, th I think that that's the biggest step to take. But it's not always a death sentence. I had a 20 year run. That wasn't bad. I would have preferred to have a longer run, of course, but that's okay. This is the cards I was dealt. And at least I know that, you know, I can get to my to-do list, which I do. My bucket list, my to-do list, and, um, you know, not everybody's blessed to do that. So I wanted to talk to you about some of the symptoms and signs that you should not ignore about possible ovarian cancer. Some of these symptoms have other common causes, but if you had everything on the list, I would go see the doctor. Do you know what I'm saying? So if you suspect that, you should always talk to your doctor when you have symptoms. But let me go over a couple things. I have a list right here. And the first one is abdominal pain, pelvic pain. That's pretty obvious, as I spoke of before. Um, if you're doubled over in pain all of a sudden, and then it kind of subsides, everybody's different, though. That was my experience. And that was the one driving force that kept me going to a doctor. If you have pains like that, and I'm not talking about menstrual pains, this is a little different. And you'll know the difference if you've ever had menstrual pains. But there's just this, it's almost like somebody's squeezing your insides. That really, really hurts. Yeah, definitely. There's some, that's your body telling you. Pain is your body telling you there's something not right. And nobody should tell you it's gas. And I was wondering if I had had insurance then, would they tell me? It was just gas, you know, and would that have changed my prognosis if I had, you know, gotten, gotten treatment a couple years earlier? I don't know. So back pain also, because that can be related in the same area if you've got lower back pain, especially, and pain radiates. You don't always know where it's really coming from. You know, I mean, you might say, oh, that's around my kidney area. It could be something else. There are women that have had back pain and found out they had a heart attack or something just indigestion, you know. So you 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 don't know, and you know you don't have to always run to WebMD. <laughs> um, talk to your doctor. Next on the list is appetite changes, and that is definitely still an issue for me. I'm not actually. It's not. The loss of appetite, which is definitely one of the symptoms. You don't have to have all these symptoms, but you either lose your appetite or you feel really full after just a little bit. And I always feel a little full after a little bit, but this was an extra little bit. I mean, and even now, you know, because I still have the cancer, obviously. I can get full after like three bites of something and I've just got to put it aside. And some people have indigestion, nausea, which I definitely have, and uh, 
or they vomit after they eat. I have definitely done that. I have done that in the middle of a meal, excused myself. And I should have probably gone to a further away bathroom because I kind of grossed my husband out. <laughs> Sorry about that, hon. I don't think he ate <laughs> the rest of his meal. And also these appetite changes can lead to unexpected or unintended weight loss. So even, even weight loss and, and your, even if your appetite hasn't changed or your eating habit hasn't changed, unintended weight loss is a sign your body's telling you something's wrong. Okay? That can be cancer. That can be diabetes. Whatever it is, it can be serious. So talk to your doctor. Changes in bathroom habits. To put it nicely it may be constipation it may be diarrhea i had a little bit of both but mostly diarrhea that was the other reason i wanted to talk to the doctor now you may be diagnosed with you might have diverticulitis or um, something you know similar with your bowels but that might even be a sign of a colon cancer too. I mean, you need to talk to your doctor. Talk to your doctor. Okay. Changes in menstruation. Now, obviously I had everything taken out, so I was postmenopausal by the time I was 41. <clears throat> However, you might miss periods, which I I did. I had very irregular periods. You might have um, you might bleed excessively, which I did. You might have spotting when you don't have your period. And, and if you use certain birth control and you're, you know, that is usually regulates things. It doesn't always. Um, and hopefully it doesn't cover symptoms up that you should be paying attention to. And if you're postmenopausal and you experience vaginal bleeding, then you definitely should also speak to your doctor. Pain during sex. Yeah, that's, that's a big one. Um, common causes can be just simple like vaginal dryness or um, inflammation, but it could also be endotremesiosis, which comes with also excessive vaginal bleeding, uh, which I believe I had. But here's the thing endotremesiosis can actually put you at a higher risk for ovarian cancer. So nothing to mess around with. And then there's bloating, and that is definitely tied to a peritoneal situation or ovarian cancer because the abdominal cavity, like I felt bloated, definitely. But there are two types of bloat. There is just the bloating where you're, you're holding on to water or whatever. And then there is something called ascites. And that's A-S-C-I-T-E-S. -E that is where you actually fill up with water in the abdominal cavity where there should not be any water. There should not be any water in that cavity. But it fills up with water. It makes you feel like you're pregnant. It makes you look like you're pregnant. People have it at different degrees. I had a client who had ascites and he had um, hepatitis. You know, so it could be other reasons, but you've got to get that drained. Okay? You've got to get a syringe in there and they've got to drain that. It's, it's a pressure that really is painful. I have been very blessed not to have ascites, but it is very common with people with perineal issues and ovarian cancer. I believe high grade or low grade, but mostly it's with a perineal situation. Um, nausea. Nausea is a big one too. And that was another thing I had. So I didn't have all of these, but I had a lot of them. And don't dismiss that there's something wrong. But if you have like one, maybe two things going on, 
don't get crazy. There could be other reasons. You know, a lot of people just like look at symptoms and go, I got all of those, you know, maybe not at the same time. I don't know. But yeah, don't, don't go nuts. Stay calm, but definitely talk to your doctor about your concerns. That's what they're there for. And don't ever let a doctor just dismiss you. Because if they do, that's not your doctor. Go get another opinion. I'm a big believer in that managing your own health care. It's been a buzzword, buzz phrase for years. Because the system can be broken. The healthcare system is not always wonderful. And it fails us. So we have got to pay attention to our bodies. And if this helps one person, then I, I'm thrilled. Okay. Enough said today. I want you to take care of yourself. I want you to feel blessed and be blessed because you're blessed and I'm blessed. All right, until next time. Bye.